I believe that is us, yes? Righty ho. Good evening and welcome to Cam Glen Radio's Big Weekend now. Oh, wait a minute. Steve Warner's Big Weekend, the unfamiliar special, take two. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> Right, good evening and welcome to Cam Glen Radio's Big Weekender. I'm Steve Warner, and if my show ever had a special tonight, is that I'm joined by no less than the director, producer, and lead male actor of this year's must-see horror movie, The Unfamiliar. Uh, welcome director Hank Pretorius, producer Llewellyn Grief, and lead male actor Christopher Den. Good evening, gentlemen, and thank you so much for joining me in The Big Weekender. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for having good us. Good evening. Right. Straight in, trying to release this movie in 2020 was no easy task. A string of postponement, uh, postponements by the major is kind of testament to that. Uh, a simple thing like trying to hold a meeting has proven difficult in light of recent isolation, isolation measures and obviously my inter internet connection. How have you had to adapt to promote and ultimately release this movie? He's going to go, Hank, me. I think it's you, Lua. Okay, well... Like I said to you before, Stephen, we were speaking offline, the, the big challenge was that the audience didn't disappear. The audience just shifted. You know, the mm -hmm. cinemas may have closed. So that was a big knock for the entire industry and the entire world. But luckily for us, the world was at least geared up with, you know, content being able to reach people at their homes. Yeah. So Hank and I immediately went back to the drawing board. We said, okay, well, you know, we, we were very disappointed because, you know, as a filmmaker, you love releasing things on the big screen and everything that Hank's ever directed and written has always been for the big screen. So there's so much attention to detail on the sound and the score and the elements that you really, truly appreciate on a big screen. Um, not to say that it's not good enough on a small screen or a good home theater, but those are the things you really work towards to have that cinematic experience. Yeah. So we just completely shifted our focus online and realized, okay, well, if we've got to go digital, we've got to go out there with a bang. It's really tough being digital because as you can imagine, there's a lot of noise out there and to get through the noise is always the challenge. So it wasn't just us as independents that said, we need to move from cinema to digital. It was everybody. So even the studios, look, some studios held back, but some didn't. For example, Trolls, they still went out digitally. They had a big, big um, campaign that did really well. Um, but for us, it was, it was exciting because, you know, usually you become much more creative when you're under pressure and suddenly mm. don't have as much as you had before. So we just shifted all our focus like we did when we, you know, when, when Hank developed and wrote the film and when we produced the film, you're always under that strain as independent filmmakers. We just applied that again exactly for the past three, four months just to get the digital campaign and to from, like you say, from your offices around the world to reach the US, the UK and in all the other territories. So it's, it's been a challenge, but it just, it didn't stop us and it's still not stopping us and we're still not giving up. We're out in the UK now, we're releasing in South Africa soon. We had a few cinematic um, deals though. We're going out in cinema in, in the Benelux region, um, Vietnam and in Indonesia. So it's not, it's not all just digital. So how's that red carpet going to, is that good? Are you going to go? Are you going to go? We may. I think, I think any red carpet, we want to go. <laughs> we'll be exactly. there. Exactly. If you need somebody to hold a camera, give me a shout. I'm there for you. <laughs> right. Now I have to say, I've seen the film and I loved it. Um, I'm, I'm into anything zombie, ghost, monster, thriller. I'm totally there. Uh, as I said before, strangely, I'm the exact opposite when it comes to horror games. I think it stems from the fact that you're in control and deliberately walking into situations that you wouldn't, you wouldn't normally do in real life. Um, I'm still working through The Last of Us 2. I've been at that for about two months. Um, something I wasn't prepared for was your movie seemed to evoke that same kind of fight or flight response. And I, I sort of I put that down to the, the, the pace of the thing. Um, there's a scare kind of around every corner, which I loved. I mean, as I was saying, The Exorcist, it was four hours of a build-up to three minutes in the bedroom, saying nothing. Um, I get that the lighting, sound effects, action, music all works toward um, carrying the viewer on that roller coaster. As a writer, Hank, or Hank, how much of that combination of elements do you have in your head when you put a uh, pen to paper in a project like this? Or is it one of these things that evolves? Or is there a lot of serendipity in the thing? I think it was quite an organic process with my co-writer, Jennifer Nicole Stang, um, which we studied quite a lot of horror films before we embarked on the journey. Mm. And then it's all about staying true to the character, knowing that she's coming from war, thinking she's got PTSD, 
uh, like in the unfamiliar. And then finding out there's something more sinister going on in a house and just completely staying true to what that may be and uh, let your imagination wander off as much as you can within the context of the, the story rules. And so I think, I think that's where the, the building of tension comes from. That's where the, um, some of the original scares came from. And then incorporating that with uh, wine mythology was an interesting angle to explore some new rituals and folklore. Yeah. Uh, Christopher, uh, on an independent, I imagine you're not afforded as much time to absorb who your character is as you would in like a kind of major. Um, how much of what we see on screen comes from the page and how much is what you add to it? Um, well, I think most of it comes from the page, really. Um, I think that that's one of the interesting things as an actor, we get a script, uh, a new script, and you're reading it. You kind of, uh, first you read it just as, as, a, as a spectator, really. You try to just read it and see it and, and what it does. And then once you got the part, you start a kind of a detective work. You you start looking into, well, what, what has the writer put in there that are kind of little clues to what your characters like, what, what they do. And then uh, after that, you sort of bring, you have to bring stuff to it. Um, you know, it's, it's not, uh, I mean, this, this guy is sort of in my age, probably a little bit younger. We, we managed to color the beard, so I look a little bit younger, so that's all right. That was one of the best special effects in the film, to be <laughs> honest, you know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you, you sort of, you, you bring yourself to it. And as I said, this guy is, uh, he is more or less me, but obviously I'm not a professor in, in ancient mythology or Polynesian mythology and stuff like that. So, so you have to kind of then start looking at, well, well, what's, what can I bring and what do I need to take on to, to build and create this character? And as you say, you know, it's, uh, there's not a lot of time to do that. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, the thing. obviously you've got all the time in the world on your own, but there's not a lot of time with, you know, the, the, the other cast or even the director on, until you're on set where you can sort of, you know, I, your ideas. And uh, then Hank says, no, that's totally wrong. Uh, let's do it the other way. <laughs> no, we never did that. No, your, your, your interpretation of the character was spot on from day one. And I think you brought a, a, quite a lot to the, to the table because I was watching it and I was like, oh, oh yeah, that, that's, um, you know, as I said in a couple of times, I think that uh, Chris really brought a substance to the role and a difference in performances, uh, which will make uh, more sense when you watch the film, that was really unexpected and lovely to watch. Um, and then also you had to uh, really get to know the wine language and the colloquial, you know, and saying the words in the right way. And I think that was really challenging and, and he got it. And you even sang a song in Hawaii, which is really cool. <laughs> Oh, well, do you want to give us a couple of lines? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, talk about... <laughs> Sorry, I'm There's a couple of lines. I think, you know, you know that old saying? <laughs> no, I can't even remember it now. Do you know That's what scene, one of the beautiful what... actor. You kind of, you remember something for a scene. Uh -huh. Sorry? One of the best... Um, Say that again, I didn't hear that. One of the best bits of exposition I've ever heard in a film was, and I can't kind of remember it word for word, it was when the wife says to you, just because you're a professor or something, just back from university, what was it? That's almost right. <laughs> help me out, help me out. Yeah. <laughs> you're a professor uh, at Oxford University in uh, Polynesian mythology. And you know, yeah, it's a, it's a mouthful. And, Isn't and it Jemima just? did really well on that one. <laughs> I, I yeah. really like that. One I thing I would say is like, you know, that you know that, <laughs> that old saying, <laughs> you have that old saying in, in film that you never work with animals and ch children. He obviously did both this one, but yeah. I want to add, you know, singing in Hawaiian. Um, <laughs> while carrying, exactly. <laughs> uh, I agree. An eight month old baby. <laughs> I, I, I want to carry it, put that one in, in that saying. Oh, I'm telling sure. you, that's a remix waiting to happen. <laughs> that's that's what you should have had at the closing credits. You saw it. Hi. Sounds good. Hank, you should have that. Anna, Anna should have that in, in the music. 
Right, Hank. Uh, you're a Britain-based, multi-award winning and commercially celebrated South African-born filmmaker. Talk about a, a mouthful. Ah, uh, that's you've a worked in, <laughs> Isn't it just? <laughs> you've worked, shut up, I'm trying to read this. You've worked in front of the camera <laughs> as well as behind. Um, but the one thing that stands out to me, not that I'm dismissing any of the other stuff, is you refined your skills as a filmmaker and some of South Africa's most notable comedies. When was the moment you thought, I'm making a change from comedy, I'm going to make a horror, or did Llewellyn play a part in steering you in that direction to expand Dark Matter's portfolio? Well, to be completely honest, I, I really um, had a passion for horror once I saw that little girl stand behind you at the moment, right over there. It's just, oh, yeah. you know, that, that kind of enlightened it in the, in the beginning. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then... <laughs> I thought I'd check anyway. <laughs> uh, I thought she's no, the way <laughs> I didn't drop this massive box of horrors at my house and he said, ah, he, he loves horror films and I, you know, why don't I get into it? And I watched this for two weeks and I was petrified. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't stand it. I was watching it like this. And then eventually I really got it. And I looked at the films and I saw, okay, well, there's, there's a lot of darkness in it, but there's these characters fighting for, their light and their thematic and it's his yep. pursuit of that. And that's, that's really what, what stuck with me, you know, like watching films like um, the Babadook where it's a, it's a woman dealing with grief and going through it, but really wanting to um, find a way to live with it. And, and films like that really got me thinking about it. And that's where I attached to the, to the idea of doing that. Yeah. Uh, Llewellyn, in 1982, this is something I just came up with today. In 1982, John, uh, John Carpenter's The Thing was released into an unsuspecting world, a visceral vision of an alien trying to survive on Earth. Uh, now, we can look at it today as a classic horror movie uh, with all the genres, must-haves, isolation, hidden enemy, limited resources, uh, a small group's fight for survival against unimaginable odds. Uh, what a lot of people don't know, is it was a flop at the time because it was released at the exact same time as Steven, uh, Steven Spielberg's E.T. And the yeah, audience right. went with the light-hearted Correct. alien over the scary alien. Um, now, Dark Matter um, has released the unfamiliar the same year the Ghostbusters Afterlife was due to be released. And that's where the parallel came into me. I thought the fact that they're postponed to March 2021 is serendipitous, I imagine, for you guys. Light-hearted ghosts take a back seat to the more malevolent spirit. Um, is this something you consider when you're looking at a release date for an independent uh, or is it not something that uh, an independent would see as direct competition? No, no, no. We most certainly look at that. And, and Hank and I have managed to build a really good relationship with our favorite distributors over the past few years. So in South Africa, for example, when we used to release a theatrical there, we try and release it at a time where there's no other competition because it would be silly to go out on the same day as The Conjuring, for example. I mean, The Conjuring is a wonderful franchise of horror. If you don't have a choice, it's fine because hopefully your marketing campaign is good enough so that your your audience is specific to your film and the audience for The Conjuring may be different. But those two are quite close. So, um, you know, releasing our horror next to, say, a slasher horror would have been different because it's different tropes. But ideally, we always try and release them not too close to something very similar being released. You can't always control that, you know, because obviously the distributor is under tremendous pressure. They've got films on their slates. Um, and lucky for us, um, you know, there were actually, when we released um, The Unfamiliar in the UK, it was supposed to be, that that was the week that Conjuring 3 was going to be released. Um, but then they moved, they pulled it back, obviously, to wait for a bigger release. And then we managed to get into that week. So um, otherwise, you know, we may have considered a week before or a week after. Sometimes yeah. they complement each other. Sometimes everyone's in the mood for horror. And it's, you know, if it's like thematic, like it's Halloween now, and yeah, yeah, everyone's yeah. in a Halloween mood, the whole of the month is almost like Halloween. It's different. But no, you definitely take that into consideration and you try and you know give your your film even though it's independent you're still competing against all the other independents and all the studios you want to give it the best chance possible so that your audience can get to it and the combination of your marketing and your targeted sort of reach versus when it gets released that's that is sort of the sweet spot that that all independent producers and filmmakers try and achieve mm. um, obviously 2020 or as i like to call it year of the bookcase Christopher, I kind of believe you fell back into that again. Uh, it's rained in everybody's parade, financially, mentally, societally. 
uh, now I believe um, was it uh, COVID um, when it kicked in, you had already finished the production of the movie. Um, when news broke mid March about the pandemic, was there a time when you thought uh, the impending lockdown was going to stop this film being shown in cinemas or postpone its release? We we I mean, most certainly did, but yeah it's, no it's we, the we, most, we, some... we we most certainly did and it, it was a really really difficult decision for myself and Hank to make because do you delay it and wait for cinemas to restore do you go for it and hope that certain cinemas open again but the thing about the pandemic and everything that happened is there was there were so many uncertainties there were so many variables that we couldn't measure so we thought one thing we have to do is realize that we do have a new film for 2020 where a lot of films were pulled back like you say moved to 2021 so that's an opportunity to still get our title out there in a time where there weren't many titles available that's the one thing and the other thing is losing a cinema deal was it was tough for us you know it's the first time we've ever released a film where we didn't have a premiere where we didn't have the big hype and it was something for us to get used to but at the end of the day, we still had the opportunity to release a film in a time where a lot of people's productions were shut down midway. Um, they couldn't finish their films. They couldn't release the films. So we had to do with the information we had at that point. And, and luckily we did actually because cinemas have reopened now, but it's, the numbers are dire. You know, cinemas are really, really struggling. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a lot of money to go out on, you know, we were going to do a wide release in the UK of over 200 screens. And that's a lot of money to put out on your print and advertising and try and recoup. Yeah. So it's, it's difficult. And maybe, you know, five years from now, we'll look at retrospectively and look at certain things. But Hank and I are still very happy with the decision that we made to go out now digitally um, and try and reach people in their homes. You know, some people are still staying at home, don't want to go to the cinema yet, or just have got used to watching things digitally. So, yeah, we're very, very happy with the decision we made. And, you know, a few years from now, we can look back and see how that entails. But I think it's, it's going to be quite a bumpy road before cinema restores to its... Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to move this microphone. I keep... <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Christopher Dane, famed actor and writer, known for Wren EastEnders and your role as Arathorn, father of Aragorn in 2009 movie, Born of Hope. Uh, now you've won Best Actor uh, in 2011 at the London Independent Film Festival for the role of John Foster in the feature Being Sold. I'm told you had three days to prepare for that role. As this is an independent with budgetary restraints, it must yeah. have placed you in a very similar situation. Uh, when you, basically, you have to act with someone that you've only met like a few hours before um, and still convinced of you in public that you've been a family unit forever. Um, how heavily do you rely on the script to pull that off, the director, or the dynamic between you and your fellow actors? Well, it's, it's, it's a complete combination of, of a thing. But obviously, the, the main thing is how um, how the actors gel, not just as the characters, but as people as well. And, and I think, and I think Hank will probably um, agree with that. That the the casting process in in sort of any project, any field project, is the most important ones where you kind of you you don't just look at the individual actor whether they fit the script description where they look like what Hank has had sort of uh, visualized but also how they work together um, and, and and putting people together is, is really that's where the is and, and for for this for this one this particular project uh, it, I think we sort of felt it when we um, we did read through the first time we were all together um, we did a read through of, of the whole script and it we sort of seemed to click and and uh, we really just after read through we went out in the park um, outside and took some pictures because we needed some family pictures for you know the frames if you, if you look in the film the wall of pictures of the family and and them together and um, and I sort of remember us just kind of clicking and, and I can't remember I think it was the photographer who sort of said to me oh can you do something with Harry that's a bit sort of dad like and before I knew it, I kind of sort of just slung him up on my shoulders and dangled him and he was just laughing and stuff. And, and that's when he kind of go, 
yeah, I, I think this will work. <laughs> and it sort of did. Uh, it, it, it clicked sort of straight away. Every time you see a film. Say that again, I didn't hear that. Every time you see a movie and you see the family photographs, you think that was taken two hours beforehand. Everybody thinks that, I think. They must have just went out with like, a change of clothes and just, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Somewhere, somewhere where that would be, photographs are taken. There's a photograph there where it's a different location. There's a photograph there where it's a different location. It's <laughs> turning a big circle. Um, how does a production team pull together the right cast for a film like this? Um, I have to say the cast looked believable as that family unit. Um, not easy whilst portraying a family going through like, harrowing events like this. Um, I think the, the, the casting process, I always look at like, like w when I see people, I, I'm always imagining, okay, like if you put them together, would you believe them as a family? Number one, obviously. Yeah. And, then, and, and then number two, I also, also look at like their style of acting because if um, what I liked about Jemima and Chris is they incredibly believe, you, you believe them when they perform. The, the performance is, is going on in the subtext or inside of them. It's not, it's not something outside of them. And, and that, that really works. And then the other thing is, it's simple things like the height of actors, you know? It's, it's weird things that you don't think about. Like if you have an incredibly tall person next to a really small person, it won't work. So you, you've got to actually go and check, oh, okay, okay, cool, this person is this, this height and that person is this height, it sort of will work. Otherwise, you know, you, you end up putting people on boxes and stuff and it just makes the hey. process very long. <laughs> Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise has made a career out of that, by the way. <laughs> well, he can at least run very good. I mean, oh, like, every time I watch him run, I feel guilty for not going to the gym, you know. Like, <laughs> that's, that's really amazing, you know. But, um, I, th yeah. I think he's... I think he's got a clause in his contract that says must have leather jacket. Have you noticed? <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I, I, I respect Tom Cruise a hell of a lot there. I think, I think the amount of action work that act does, is like incredible. I, I've looked at his scenes and I'm like, I, 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 I don't know if I would do it, you know, and this is, this guy doesn't have to work for a day in his life and he goes yeah. out and does it. You know, it's amazing. You know? But um, yeah, the casting process with this specific film, was more or less we we had all these online tapes coming in um and i know chris from all, all these performances and stuff that i watched and also uh -huh. jemima i looked at her performances and i was like wow this is my number one choice and luckily we, we were lucky enough to to get them and then with harry mcmillan hunt he also sent us a tape and he was amongst so many um like really good actors and what really grabbed me of him was the way he changed with the actor with like, he was playing essentially two people at the same time and, and the way he got that and changed in his performance on the audition tape already. And then Rebecca Hansen, which is amazing. And, and the same goes for Rachel Lynn, which is like, Oh yeah, no, that, that would absolutely work. And, yeah. and that, that's how he got them. So it was more or less like online castings. Uh, there was no official like room where people came in, you know, what, what about the dog? Where'd that come from? The dog, you wouldn't believe, but you like actually cast dogs as well. So they like send you really? videos. Oh, this dog can do this. This dog can do that. How do I like this dog? And they have names and everything. So it's like, it's pretty much like casting an actor in a way. Yeah. What, what I loved was when Jemima came home right at the very beginning of the movie and the dog just ran right past her. <laughs> well, it's, no, she didn't come from war. She forgot about it. <laughs> I know, I know. It was the clothes. That's what it was. The camouflage. You didn't see her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will have yeah. to go white yeah. watch this film because I can't remember that. <laughs> I, I, I remember the dog. I think the dog actually runs around her. It's just when the camera no, cuts. Runs around her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, the, the, the director, keen eye for detail. Right. <laughs> the family house is a character unto itself. Um, how did you source that? And, well, what was the whole process of getting that place? That was the first house we, we saw. In, uh, the very first. Yeah, Tory Butler Hart, um, um, they played a crucial role in this because they, they were line producing. Uh, she was line producing with her husband, Matthew Butler Hart, which is the production manager on, on the film. And they had this great tool to show us all these locations. And the first location they took us to was this incredible house. And I looked at it and I'm coming from a South African perspective. Now, this house got four stories 
and just like a lot of creeks and if you put the if you switch the lights off i'm scared so we're like oh this is a great house you know <laughs> and then the same went for um the american house there's only a few american houses you can choose from and this one was just like one of those houses where if you switch off the lights and you're there alone you don't need to watch a horror film you will not be able to sleep you know so that was really like <laughs> that was really what it uh, what it was yeah yeah um christopher uh, as an actor uh, in this movie you've got an unbelievable task or an, un an unenviable task um, of knowing your lines, knowing your positioning um, at any given scene, knowing what your fellow actors are supposed to be saying or doing. Um, so it must take reacting to the scares doubly difficult when you know what's coming. Was there a point where the director held the scares back? Or is it one of these things you develop as a talent over the years? Look, I can do well, it Well, I'm not too... <laughs> See, that, I'm not too much involved in in a lot of the scary stuff. Uh, I, I leave that to the to the women in, in yeah. the house. They, they they go and do all the scary stuff and all the the things. But but what, what really is with filmmaking is that it, it's such a technical um, thing, especially mm. when there are practical effects that have that have to sort of work and and certain stuff. Like that. So actually, it. You know, filming a horror film uh, is is not really that scary. Um, yeah. As um, see, that's disappointing. As an actor, uh, because <laughs> there are loads of people around you. <laughs> There's oh, well, loads like of I... people around you. There's a lot of thing, things going on, and it, it's very technical. Um, okay. I probably the people in the Blair Witch Project. Um, that was a different experience. But oh, nice. when it's like this sort of thing, where it is, and traditional, it's different. See, one of the things now, I can edit this out if you don't want me, or if you don't want me to kind of mention it, but when an actor changes from a good guy to a bad guy, um, oh God, I can't remember that guy's name. Derek Jacobi was really good at doing stuff like that. It's like when you, they, they become inherently evil, there's a very subtle change in their face. How does an actor pull that off? I mean... I, I, I try it, but I always end up looking like, you know, you, you know, I'm when a child of the 80s, so a bad guy always had like the beard and kind of wrung their hands and stuff. Whereas these days, you basically get actors that can just turn it on like that. How, how do you pull off a thing like that? No saying that you become evil in any way in this film. But if you were to be, how would you pull that off? Well, I, I, I mean... For me, what I do is it's, I say it's simple, but it's, it's kind of in the mindset. So when you're acting, you know, it's, it's what's going on in your head. And if you, if, you t if, you, if you are going from being the good guy who is good, good and believe good into the bad guy who kind of knows probably a bit bad and he has some intentions and he, wants to do different stuff to the person he's talking to. So instead of being in a good frame of mind and I want to, to please this person or compliment them or whatever, I'm now thinking, I kind of want to kill these people. That kind of then forms what's going, what's happening in your head comes hopefully through your eyes and in your whole sort of demeanor without having to do a lot. I think the, the worst bits that you see on screen is when people really act evil yeah. um, because that's never believable. Yeah. Uh, that was sort of the point I was making. It was, it was, it was that subtle that you kind of believed it, if you know what I mean. Um, Hank, um, now this is a scary movie and predominantly driven by practical effect, uh, effects, uh, which means if you see something happening to the, the, the Cormac family, it's something you filmed with the actor. Was there ever a point where you thought, I can't ask the actor to do that? Or that having filmed the scene, you thought, have I gone too far? You know, <laughs> there were loads of times like that. Yeah. <laughs> At least five Good times job. I can think about. <laughs> the, the, the worst one was, the, the, worst, the worst thing I asked was Jemima to lie down so that I can throw some black liquid over her. Now, Luana always jokes that if the liquid was green right. or pink, it'd be fine. But the liquid is black. 
Now, the thing is with Jemima, she's a great sport and she really does all her stunts. It's really amazing working with her. But everyone looking at it is going like, <gasps> and then that, that really upsets everyone. So it was like this, this really difficult thing to, to ask and she just did it and luckily it was just one take. And then, yeah. with, um, and then after that, I had to ask Harry McMillan Hunt, which is uh, that's, the boy. That's what sparked the Throw this liquid over him. And he did this scream while he was doing it. And his dad was sitting next to me and he got so emotional because he's seeing his son like being hurt yeah. and he's completely buying into it. But afterwards, Harry's just like high-fiving me and saying, yeah, let's do it again. Well, and then he does it and he's like, ah, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just bizarre. And then there's a, you know, about six other occasions or five, four other occasions I can think about as well, which I was like, especially like underwater, like underwater, yeah. Even though we've got like five divers, very safe. We've got safety officers, you know, <laughs> but still, like, it's still under. You know, <laughs> that, yeah. that was one of the things I was going to ask you about the um, Jemima's stunt. You know, the, the underwater stuff. First of all, um, was it all stunt people, or did she do it? And second of all, Llewellyn, how did a producer react uh, when a director asks, "Can I take my lead uh, female actor?" and put them underwater in the dark and have somebody pull them backwards. Oh, I get super excited. We get to go to a tank and we get to go do things. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I must say, I mean- I'd be thinking I mean, insurance. No, no, well, yeah, that, that too. But I think, I mean, we, you know, we sort those things out long before the production. So those things are already sorted. And obviously you'll never do something that don't make your, um, you, you, you want your cast to feel safe. But that's, the, I think, and, and Chris can vouch for that, that's the independent filmmaking spirit. Everyone's quite keen to push themselves in their craft. And and Chris was like, well, what do I get to do here? Well, let me, I'll give it another go. And he was always a great spirit. And he was always like committed and let me do it again. Or I can do this. Harry Macmillan Hunt was a trooper. He was just fearless. I mean, he just, you know, sort of stormed into everything. And I mean, the tank scenes were intense because it was, contrary to belief it's very hot in there because it's all closed up so it becomes very humid and it's very uncomfortable and obviously because the actors are underwater we forget that they can't see anything you know they don't have goggles on so when they open their eyes someone's going okay swim to your right and then they're like because they're underwater they forget they go to the other right or go to the left or so it's quite strenuous and it's it's really really tough so you might see a few seconds of something but it takes hours and hours just to get that perfect scene um I think, you know, the, the, the key is just every time they've done a scene, you know, the team, they were brilliant. The divers, every time you're comfortable, you, you're okay, you want to go down again, et cetera. Um, it, was, it was really, really safe and it was a lot of fun, but it was very, very taxing. You know, it's a lot of work, not just for the actors, but for the crew as well, because it's close proximity, the gear has to be sealed off and, you know, there's a lot of water involved. Um, so, yeah, that was tough. I mean, I, I have a whole newfound respect for films where the whole thing is done, you know, the whole production's underwater. Yeah. Um, that's why I'm fascinated by how Avatar 2 is going to look and, you know, because that's all underwater. And so a lot of those things were fascinating. So I think from a producing level and from a filmmaking level, Hank and I get excited when it's something we haven't done before to answer yeah. your question. So, I mean, we, we've done certain elements in water and we've shot in the open ocean and on boats and things like that but a confined environment, the tanks, someone going down, having to swim across, you know, directing them underwater, that, that was quite a technical notch in our belt to get. So um, from that perspective, you know, we're very excited when they say, you know, we're waiting for the next scene where we blow up a truck and drop something off a building, you know, we're very excited. So people always react really kind of favorably, a big practical effect. It's, it's, I think Lord of the Rings was, was you know, a, a big thing. I mean, um, you, you're kind of spin off, there's not a kick in the backside off of the, the whole kind of production value of the thing, um, Christopher. But I think, you know, you can, you can mm -hmm. tell the effects, it's the practical effects that are the big hitters, I think. I think you can always tell the quality or the metal of a film by, by the, the effects that they use in it. If it's subtle and you don't even notice it, then you've, you've won a watch, I think. Um, right, Hank, how was it to shoot? Uh, with your first your first film in Britain with a predominantly British crew. Yeah, it was quite a. Uh, it's it's culturally quite different to South Africans. I think um, the, the the British crew is is incredibly focused and they're very detailed and it's almost like they Swiss clockmakers, where they will do something incredibly incredibly well and very specific. 
where South Africans just take on every responsibility they can find and they just go for it. You know, we, we're much more of a, we, we like cowboys. We go, <laughs> ah, we have to do this and this. Okay, no problem. <laughs> and we, and we, this, this film was edited in South Africa though, wasn't it? It was a yeah. It was a, it was a combination of British crew yeah. and South African crew, which was lovely, and as well as like everywhere from the world. To be honest with you, like like we had Eastern European crew. It was amazing, you know. So we we really had the best of the best, you know. It was one of those situations where they balance each other out in the most perfect way, and um, the shooting process was difficult because we only had a very limited amount of time. We had a very big ambition to do this big film in a very small amount of time. Yeah. But then the post-production, um, like I worked with a, a composer called Walter Meir that taught me so much about music. And also he's just a great guy and he was incredible and in, in yeah. what he brought to the film afterwards. And then um, I worked with Jim Petrock, which is the, the, uh, most of the sound design and also the final mix. Um, and he's a South African. So it was this incredible mix of people and then on site, which did the, the, uh, colorist and also the deliverables for us. Yeah, yeah. There was an incredible mix of people that we just put together and I got to experience like the strength of all these HIDs. And yes, it was definitely, there was a, a cultural shift that I, I'm glad I took. I, uh, I'm, I'm happy that I'm in Britain and I could be making films. Yeah, I think it's the most incredible thing to be able to do. Yeah. But at the same time, I still want that Af South African element in my films as well, you know, yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. I think Llewellyn agrees with it. It's like we, we, we together the best, the, I think the, the good hybrid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like you go, you go to war together, you know, it's like a, it's yeah, like yeah. a team that just takes everything on and, and our philosophy always has been, and maybe it's because the South African industry is very small compared to the UK mm -hmm. where when these things started happening and Hank was a, you know, a big player in pioneering the, the, the sort of local film industry there and, bringing it to its fruition but that made you want to like sort of be involved everywhere so it's not like you do this and you only do this you always want to learn about everything so it makes you like this this hungry pack and you're just like let's do this let's figure it out and the, the goal always was and always is if the film wins we all win so yeah. it's always like what can make the film better and it's better for all of us yeah, it's never yeah. about the individual so a british crew is like a sniper and a south african crew is like rambo <sighs> I like it. <laughs> Give me a minute. Give me a minute. <laughs> I've been dying to call for like the past 10 minutes. Hold on. Yeah. This dry cough, it's ever since I heard out about the COVID. Anyway, right. I was going to ask you about the, the composers, right? So my, my kind of history as a DJ, composer, producer, that sounds really pretentious when I say it, right? I'll edit that out. Um, what are people doing? seem to know about me as my influences as a child weren't the, the UK charts and stuff like that it was uh, the music and TV films games all that kind of stuff it was the score that did it for me um, which is it's kind of weird for a guy that, that, that basically pedals dance and trance um, my, my mother liked country stuff my dad liked uh, like the crooners um, my sister liked Motown my brother was into like heavy rock and I ended up into kind of like Jean-Michel Jarre and other kind of electronic stuff because it was very, it, it's very emotive. There's a lot of strings. There's a lot of feeling in these things. Now, um, I loved stuff like Hill Street Blues, Blade Runner, uh, The Omega Man. <laughs> That's a crazy one, but that was a kind of low budget film for the time. But the 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 music in it was was like a big hitter for me. Um, what what I loved about it was that kind of music would build tension or it would lift your spirits, uh, spirits with like a hero theme and um, stuff that you don't get and kind of chart stuff and all that kind of thing. Now, um, when you were selecting a composer for this project, what made you use uh, or choose Walter? Uh, apart from the list of awards as long as his arm, um, why did Walter specifically fit your vision? And for the record, um, I love Killzone <laughs> and he done the music for that. And that was the franchise that made me buy my first ever um, games console. So there oh, you go. Serendipity. Oh. That's a, that was a six degrees of separation. You're six people away from one thing in your life to the person that done it. I, I'll, I'll tell you something about Walter, right? Yeah. Um, so the, there's this piece of music. Um, and actually, uh, uh, the other producer, Baron Kruger, introduced me to, to Walter. I think that's right. But there's this piece 
this piece of music that I find one of the most incredible pieces of music that builds tension and it's in a massive film. And I'm not, I'm not going to reveal it because he was a, a ghost writer on this film. Okay. okay. So the first day I want to meet Walter, I come with this piece of music and I say, listen, this is kind of what I'm feeling for this film. This is the piece of music. It's in one of the biggest films of all time. It's basically in one of the top five. I'll, I'll tell you that much of all time. And I'm saying, this is what I would like for the unfamiliar. And I think he's going to laugh at me. So he says, uh, okay. Yeah. Do you want to know how I created that piece of music? <laughs> yeah. So I referenced his own piece of music. He did yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, he did that. Hey. That's serendipity. That. Your whole film should have been called like, serendipity. Yes, I would very much like that. And then he explained everything to me. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, from there on, I was just like, okay, cool. What do you want to do with this scene? <laughs> Let's do this. Let's do that. <laughs> so well, it's one of those guys where you just met someone that's incredibly talented and knows exactly what he's doing. And he's just a, you know, what the thing about Walter is he's not just a composer he's also one of the exec producers he comes yeah. on with finance he comes on with a uh with contacts he he yeah. really cares about what he does he puts his stamp on it but he also has a, a a way of putting the film into a um into a new light yeah. and so he, he got lake Shaw records which did the it um they did its score to release yeah. our score so yeah. our, our score is a has an official label attached to it which is yeah. lakeshore which is the biggest record label in the world uh, yeah. in releasing scores so he, he, yeah it's just an incredible human being where he just he just like really cares about you and thinks how can he help you and uh, take your film to the next level while contributing so much in the music yeah and um, we touched on games invading mainstream media uh, we spin off such as the last of us and fallout um, it was announced yesterday morning that Xbox or Microsoft acquired Zemimax, uh, home of Bethesda and the Fallout franchise, for $7.5 billion. Yes. Um, I'm <laughs> telling you. So I don't see that trend slowing anytime soon. There's a lot of money to be made in a franchise. Now, here's the question. Has or will Dark Matter ever approach a movie with the specific remit of making it commercially viable as a franchise? Um, would that mean something uh, with the broad strokes of a trilogy in place? Um, uh, there's a lot of fan films who have successfully pulled that off with zero budget. Um, if, if you're ever interested, by the way, I've got a Star Wars spin-off. It's sitting over there. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> I, I suddenly discovered the, the foibles of, of trying to write a script with it. Uh, what is it? The, what's it called? The intellectual properties people involved. So there's one there. I'm Good luck. Back. But if you're needing one, there's one there, right? You can tear that <laughs> apart there you want. Right? Anyway. So the question then is, um, would you ever um, approach the idea of making a franchise, looking at it as a, com a commercial prop? I suppose when you're making a film, that's what you're looking at it as, 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 as a commercial property. But you get my point about a franchise specifically is more... Um, stuff that you can sell do you get me I will, I will answer the first part of the question yeah, yeah, yeah. to Alan, because i think this 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 point is important right so just like people go to their job right to yeah. make money at yeah. their job because they want to have like not all artists not all artists a lot of artists do it for the love the passion and to get a part of them out there in the world which absolutely. is i think what you're going no, to no, say no. absolutely absolutely yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. I, I will get there i will get there but just as long as like, this is, so filmmaking is my job. This is what I do for a living. I, I wake up in the morning and I write a script or I think about my next idea and I put it on paint. That's all I do for a living. And it's all I've ever done since I was 24 years old. Right. Yeah. So if I want to sustain my job, I better make something that audiences want. Yeah. And I better carry on making something that audiences want. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means it doesn't imply I'm money hungry. It just implies I want to please a certain audience. I want the audience. And I always say this to young filmmakers. I always say to them, if you don't want to please the audience, you just want to express yourself. Like you just said, go and express yourself in your garage and don't 
uh, don't cost anyone any money. Yeah. And, you know, ask your parents to come over and your grandparents and then they watch it and then lovely and, and everybody knows you're an artist. But if, if you want to go into the dramatic arts or in filmmaking or anything, you have to consider the audience. Yeah. Now, it's not always a good thing to consider the audience and it's not always that they're going to love your film if you've considered them. Because, I mean, the audience, to predict the audience reaction is, is one of the most difficult things in the world if, if it's even possible. Yeah. But at the same time, you have to consider them. So I try to make a film. I always try to make a film where I try to write a script that's unique and original, all those things. And then I try to take the script and look at it and go, how can I entertain with this piece of material to a specific genre or specific audience uh, members or whatever, whatever it may be. And then you got to really put yourself through the ringer because it's easier to go, oh, I'm just an artist that I want to express myself. I don't care about the financial side of it. It's an easier thing because you're giving yourself a, a hall pass. I, I can't think like that. I have to like think, okay, um, I, I don't never think about, oh, I want to be wealthy or I want to make money or I want to sell out. I no, think I about it. I do. You, you do? All right. Well, no, I'm <laughs> <laughs> so I'm available for a price. I read that script. That Star Wars one. But but you got to you got to think about in terms of um, creating something that will be truly entertaining, and really captivate people emotionally. And I think that's always been the goal. And I think people that say they just want to make the film of the sake of expression, they really what they're saying is I'm too insecure to tell you that I hope people like it. Because yeah. I hope people like my stuff. And sometimes yeah. they do and sometimes they don't. And when they don't, it really hurts. So that's my two cents. And Luan can speak about the rest. <laughs> no, no, no. I, th I think you've, you've summed it up really well, Hank. I think, you know, that's the one thing that Hank and I both did. Like, we have the world's respect. And I have the world's respect, you know, for creative people and artists. And I love the creative process. I understand the creative process. But um, there's a very famous saying from one of the big ad agency guys from, like, the early days. It was very creative. And he said every young person that gets into the creative industry always says to them, start with the money. It's the most honest thing you can do. Yeah. And, and people don't understand. They're like, what do you mean the money? He's like, well, what are you doing? Are you going to create something that sustains yourself? Are you going to make it for someone? Or is it just going to be something you just experiment with? And if you just want to experiment and you have rich parents and all that, that's fine. That's great. You know, good for you. But if, if you're doing what Hank and I are doing, where Hank is very creative, he can write these amazing stories, but we're also trying to find an audience for it. It doesn't have to be the entire planet's audience. If you go, I'm making the film for 10 pounds, and there's a big enough audience that we could sell probably 20 pounds worth of tickets, you, that, that to me is a wonderful artistic expression, because you've actually made something that has found a bunch of strangers. If we sell 200,000 tickets of our film in Canada, we're not even Canadian, we don't live there. It means we've done something where 200,000 strangers in another country are going, oh, we like this and I want you to watch it. It's really tough. And I mean, uh, you know, the, the, there's, such, there's so many cliches around creativity and what it means to be creative or artists, all those things. But Hank has really summed it up beautifully. It's like, that's fine. You can have those expressions. You can do those things. But as soon as you go into the film business and you start taking money from investors, you have a duty of care to those investors. The same way if I say I'm going to build a property development and I'm going to take people's money. I have to finish development. I have to build the homes. I have to hope that they grow in value. I have to hope it is something. And that's still a bit easier because it's tangible. We're selling an idea. We're saying, this is an idea. Give us the money. We're going to create something. The most tangible thing you'll get is maybe the poster or the ticket or a DVD if DVD still exists. Otherwise, it's just going to be an experience. So to convince someone to give you money for entertainment or an idea or an IP is really, really tough because our assets aren't bricks and mortar. Our assets are these IPs that we create and, and, and take care of. And it's really, really tough. And we're lucky in the sense that our industry has gone digital, but it's also the same yeah. thing that makes it tough now because not everyone can get into it, but it's opened up so many avenues. I mean, if you look at Chris, for example, you know, he's really busy in all elements. So even though he acts as well, he does, you know, voice work for audio books and things like that. So there's all those elements that grow and open up. And a lot of that, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to speak on behalf of Chris, but he'll do certain things for expression, but then he'll do certain things to pay the bills and to keep going. And hopefully you get to do that in your industry. You know, Hank and I are very fortunate that every day we wake up every day. How can we grow Dark Matter Studios? How can we do something where we create more wealth of content within this industry? Where so many people in our position are like, yeah. Star Wars <laughs> <laughs> you know, talk we, to me. Talk to exactly. me. Exactly. <laughs> but so many people in our position would 
you know, try and be filmmakers by night, but they have to work full time in the day, you know, doing other things in corporate. And there's nothing wrong with that. We all, we've all been there, but huh. we're very fortunate to be able to do this every day and call it our job and our living. But like Hank said, it's, it's wonderful to be creating, but to me, there's no better feeling than when Hank creates something and we get to distribute it and there's a reaction, whether yeah. it's, a bad reaction, a good, it's caused a reaction. You've put something out there in the world that people are suddenly talking about. It's real. There's things flying around. People are referring to each other. It's just, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. And, and, and with that comes a lot of responsibility. Do you realize, Chris, if I ask you something now and it's like, yeah, man, it was, it was just, I want, you know, every word from, uh, that I spoke was torn from my body. It's going to look really superficial now. Um, that was a brilliant answer, by the way. I didn't expect as much detail as that. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, right, Christopher, you are one of the lucky few actors who can boast an epic film release in 2020. A lot of cancellations going on. Um, what's next for you this year? Um, or are you going to chill with a pen and paper and put that dream script together? Uh, I've got loads of dream scripts. So, um, so you know, we're in competition here. Hey, Star um, Wars is a uh, is taking. <laughs> no, well, the thing is, <laughs> um, right, Hank. From a writer's point of view, um, have you found yourself using the lockdown time on uh, other projects, or has it all been about the drive to push promotion of the unfamiliar? Because um, obviously, these uh, these interviews must be time consuming as well. Yeah. So, so luckily, we we had a great team behind uh, pushing the marketing of the unfamiliar which is fantastic. So we have a really cool team behind it, but I have found myself creating so much in lockdown that we now have like, I think two new television series and we're doing a new film um, straight after, you know, I suppose lockdown has opened. So I, I find it as a very fruitful time um, to, to actually develop stuff. Actually, we have three television series coming. Right. So, yeah, we were, we were just like, well, and, and Llewellyn's been doing other stuff, which is incredible. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but I kind of read, I read something, but it didn't really kind of give me much. It just said sci-fi, you know, was that? Yeah. So we're doing a, we're doing a sci-fi, dramatic sci-fi. Um, and then there's three other television series, which, which we, uh, already doing. And the, the irony of it is it's going to happen quite quickly because yeah. it's not that big budgets. Like the sci-fi is a bigger budget, but the, the television series is going to happen quite quickly. And what I've found now is like people just like, because of like lockdown and the pandemic and everything, there's a lot less pretense when you speak to people. Yeah. 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 So when you pitch an idea, you're like, listen, this is what I want to do. This is why, this is what, what's up. And if they like it, they're just like, oh yeah, I like it. Let's, let's do it. Yeah. It's not like, yes, but yes, but mm, 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 I think there's, uh, uh, you know, it's not, nothing like that. It's just like, oh, okay, cool. Let's do it. See, and to be honest, there's, you, you've basically got a captive audience because with people being in lockdown, a lot of people scared to get back into society. And the fact that we're looking at kind of lockdown too, it's not really happening, but you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, it looks as though your audience is going to be in the house and they're going to be channel hopping and they are going to want to find new content. So again, it's serendipity. I mean, fair enough, it took a global pandemic, but at least you're getting to, to kind of play your wares. Yeah, I think it's, it's lockdown has been one of those things where you can decide, I mean, we're lucky enough. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people that lost their livelihood and it's yeah, incredibly yeah. terrible. And I, I obviously have a lot of sympathy and empathy for that. But we, we're lucky enough where lockdown was like an opportunity to create stuff. And we had a film that came out over lockdown. So there was a, a clear target and focus. And then after lockdown, we just like excited to get on, on set again. You know, like, like we can't wait. Yeah. And every single person we're talking to feels the same. You know? <laughs> so it's, it's that like energy in, um, in, in a space again, which, which I'm really looking forward to. I think we're just grateful to... to yeah. Yeah, we, very much, very much. Right, well, I've, I've basically run out of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so that's us, gentlemen. Thank you very, very much. Um, what I will say is, uh, Cam Glenn Radio, I'm going to say this, I know it's, it's uh, this is a pre-record, but I'm going to say this as if it's the live thing, so that when it's cut together, it sounds okay. <clears throat> 
We at Can Glen Radio are nothing if not a champion of the independent artist or production company. I can relate in many ways to the challenge of getting that project seen and heard. Anytime you need a soapbox, give me a shout. Um, we're here for you. We're here for the community. We're here for everybody. Um, it's been my privilege to speak to you all again. Um, I can wholeheartedly recommend The Unfamiliar. Um, if you're going to watch One Horror in 2020, then that is the film. Do you have any links where these where, where our listeners can actually get this? Yeah, we do. We will. The the primary thing is obviously on all socials at Unfamiliar Movie, so Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and then we have a website which is really pretty cool for your super horror fans because it explains the law behind the mythology and the film itself and that's the unfamiliarmovie.com so for all the real horror geeks um, and fans there's a lot of detail in there around from the score to the animal sounds a few little spoiler alerts so even if you've watched it before so there's a little bit extra on that website as well for the real horror fans Hank Pretorius, Llewellyn Grief and Christopher Dane thank you so much for your time and your candid answers Good luck and may fortune favour the hard-working independent. Thank, Thank you very you much, much, Steve. Appreciate really appreciate it. it.